name is Barry Skirkus, and this is part of the Master Arts series. Today, this TV station will be airing a program on the art of bronze casting. To begin, uh, the art of bronze casting is centuries old, and the, the most formal technique was by using lost wax. Lost wax is where you make a product out of uh, wax first, and after the wax is made, you would put on the gates which are sprues that allow the metal to go in and vents which allow the air to escape or gases to escape and then uh, you would put it into an investment mold and the investment mold would then be put into a, a kiln to be burnt out. After the kiln had purged all the wax from the mold the uh, bronze would be simultaneously melted then when the mold was still warm the bronze would be poured into the lost wax investment. Artists work in a variety of different mediums. Some artists, when they're producing their sculpture, work directly in the wax. And the waxes come in a variety of types. You could use a Roman casting wax, a microcrystalline, amber waxes. Uh, there is a whole variety of waxes and pliabilities that the artist can use. Uh, if you're working in wax directly, uh, you have to be very careful that the wax doesn't get too warm uh, because it will then deform and change shape. If you are making a wax piece, it is advisable to carry it yourself to the foundry. Uh, remember, when you ship a wax work, uh, it, they are not shipped in refrigerated containers. Consequently, when it hits the foundry or gets to the foundry, uh, the wax work could have melted and shifted or sagged from its original form. Uh, if this is the case, uh, you may get back a piece that was not what it first looked like when you shipped it out. Uh, I would strongly suggest, if you're working directly in wax, to always to bring your own wax work to the foundry. Another popular way of uh, artists working is by using uh, oil-based clay. Uh, this is uh, very popular, and by sculpting the uh, work in an oil-based clay first, uh, the artist then can come back to it at multiple stages, put in more detail, add to it, subtract from it. Uh, if he's doing a rather large piece, you could build a uh, form first and then put the oil-based clay over it. After it is done, then you would make a mold. Your molds nowadays can be made out of a variety of different types of material. The most popular is a, a rubber type of a mold. Uh, in which case, you would take it to the uh, foundry, your uh, plasticine work, and then the foundry uh, would then start applying the rubber mold in sections. Uh, the, the sections of the mold are built up to about a half inch, if not thicker, to an inch thick. Uh, and then what they have to do is, after they do it in sections, they have to put in keys. Keys are areas where the piece can be interlocked and the mold won't shift or rotate. After the entire mold is made, they put it in a mother mold, which is usually a plaster containment, so the mold will stay stiff. After the mother mold is made, the pieces are treated with a release agent and put together and wax is poured into uh, the mold, it is rotated around, and then it is poured out. Uh, this is done usually about four times until the piece is built up to at least a quarter of an inch to a half inch in thickness. Uh, some pieces can be solid uh, depending on their size. Uh, however, it's not recommended. It's not economical and there's also a lot of risk of uh, shrinkage. Uh, after the piece is then pulled out of the rubber and mother mold, it is brought to the wax chaser. Uh, sometimes there might be slight imperfections in the wax as it comes out of the rubber mold. Uh, the wax chasers will then fill in any of the imperfections and make the piece uh, just as the original appeared. After that, the wax chasers will uh, put on the gates. Now the gates are the sprues and the vents. The sprues allow the metal to go in and the vents allow the gases to uh, come out. All the wax works are weighed. That tells the uh, foundry technicians how much bronze they must melt to fill that particular mold. Uh, it's a very simple process. Uh, for every pound of wax there's eight pounds of bronze that must be melted. Uh, it is very important that the bronze be weighed 
and put into the crucible. The crucible is then lowered into a furnace. A furnace is a round oven that swirls the uh, heat around the particular crucible uh, and that's through blower motors. Usually inside there you're getting up to a temperature of about 2,000 2,300 degrees. Nowadays they're using several different types of bronze. Silicone bronze is probably one of the most common and that's made out of copper, tin, and aluminum. Uh, when I was doing a lot of bronze casting in my college days uh, we were using a uh, bronze that was called 8535 which is 85 percent bronze 5 percent zinc tin and lead so uh, with the lead component in there they have stopped using that and they most bronze works are now done in silicone bronze because of safety issues after the piece is vented and gated it is ready to go through the process of the ceramic shell ceramic shell is a, a newer uh, technology in which case the wax work is dipped into a slurry and then coated with uh, a sand compound. Uh, they keep on doing this uh, and they have to let it dry in between coats. They keep on doing this until it builds up at least a quarter to a half inch in thickness. Uh, the nice thing about ceramic shell is the gases are able to purge through the material itself which reduces the amount of sprues and vents. At this point in time, the piece is ready to go to the kiln. In the old lost wax method, it would take approximately 24 hours to burn out one of the molds because the big investment molds had to be purged really slowly. And the temperature of the kiln would be about 900 degrees because if it was too warm, what would happen is the mold would crack and then your bronze would just filter through all the different cracks. With the new technique of ceramic shell, what they're able to do is they're able to purge these molds quickly because of the porous nature of the ceramic shell. Uh, they usually put it into a kiln and they uh, flash fire it, bring the kiln up to a real high temperature really quick, probably about 1200 to 1500 degrees, and all the wax melts out. Uh, these type of kilns are usually elevated so the wax can be gathered in two pots below it. And uh, usually what you do is you keep a little water in there so when the wax hits the water it solidifies and you're reducing the uh, risks of having a fire. After the molds are uh, complete, uh, there's a lot of activity that has to happen rather rapidly. The uh, foundry staff usually have two people working on the crucible and you probably have one person working on the pit, if not two people. Uh, the molds are pulled out of the kiln while they are still very hot, trying to keep it at about 700 or 800 degrees. Prior to putting them into the sand pit, uh, usually what you do is you take a torch and you heat up the sand so there is not a big temperature change uh, which will shock the mold and then what you do is you put the mold into the sand pit and you bury it all the way up to the top as much as possible. At the top of the uh, mold is a pouring cup. Now the pouring cup also serves as a uh, area, a larger area where the metal could go in and it also serves as a reservoir in order for if there's any shrinkage in the bronze as it cools it shrinks it will pull out of the reservoir which is on top. Um, after the mold is put into the sand, then what happens is the uh, two people who are grabbing the uh, crucible will walk over and they'll have a third person usually skim the top. There's a lot of slag. Slag are the impurities that form in the bronze as it's being melted. So those are pulled off and then the metal is poured. Now it's very important to pour the metal in a consistent manner. If it's poured too slow, a lot of times it can freeze up as it's going down into the piece and then you'll get an incomplete casting. If you pour it too fast, at times you may uh, overflow the pouring cup and also trap gases because of the amount of metal going in. So you want to make it a real nice continuous pour and make the metal go in in a nice easy fashion. Uh, after all this activity, which uh, goes rather rapidly because Remember, the bronze is usually melt at about 2,000 degrees. Uh, 
once you hit room temperature it cools down rather rapidly so everybody at this point in time is working very fast in order to uh, uh, keep that bronze at the premium temperature for it to go into the mold. The molds are then left there to cool. Uh, the cooling process, depending on the size of the work being cast, is usually two to three hours. Uh, after it is cool enough where you can grab it with gloves, it usually goes to a place where they're going to start chipping off the uh, ceramic shell. After the ceramic shell is uh, taken off of the art piece, then you have something called chasing. Chasing is cutting off all the gates, which are the uh, sprues and the vents. And uh, what you want to do at this point in time is you want to get them close to the surface as possible with some larger tools and you're using everything from uh, cutoff wheels to uh, grinders uh, and flexible shaft tools uh, and those come into play when you're trying to get some of the more detail work. Sometimes when the pieces come out of after the casting uh, and they may improperly fill uh, what happens is we can take it to the chasers and they can fabricate parts. If we are doing a real large sculpture, uh, those are done sectionally. So if we were doing a large equestrian piece or we're doing a large uh, portrait piece, uh, those would usually be cast in sections. And each section after it has been cast would then go to the chasers and they would weld these pieces together. Uh, the welding rods that they use is the same type of bronze that is utilized in the piece. So after the pieces are welded, they are then ground back down and there's no evidence of the sections of each of these sculptural pieces. That's uh, through the chasers and through the use of the tools. Uh, a lot of times they'll be using flexible shaft motor tools and grinders and uh, it comes out just beautiful. After you have your piece uh, rough cut then it goes to a finisher who will go in and put back in all the texture or polish it and get it to the right state. After the uh, polishing you have an option of putting it into a patina. A patina is an oxidation process in which the metal can be treated to change bronze any color underneath the sun. Uh, one of the most popular patinas is liver sulfur. In this case the uh, person in the foundry would take the uh, liver sulfur and with a brush apply it to the sculpture and after it has been applied he would take a flaring torch and that would uh, expedite the oxidation process. After it is completely finished at times they will brush in highlights with steel wool and after the uh, desired effect is achieved then they usually wax the piece. Uh, some foundries or some artists will actually put a shellac over their piece to maintain it. Uh, however, waxing is probably the most traditional way of preserving it. Now that you have a general overview of the bronze casting technique and all the components that go into it, we can now go to the foundry itself and uh, we could talk to the owner, Harry Spell, and we could find out more information about the process from a uh, technician who's been in the business for a number of years and uh, is probably the most famous piece that you'll see in Chicago is the Michael Jordan sculpture which was cast at his foundry. So let's go pick Harry's brain and find out what's going on in the foundry. Today we're out in Oregon, Illinois at Art Casting of Illinois uh, and we're here as the gracious guest of Harry Spell, owner proprietor of uh, this establishment and it's a pleasure to be here today with you Harry. This is uh, part of the Master Arts series that is made possible through the Naperville Sunrise Rotary Club and what we do is we have these uh, programs uh, educating the people in the community to different art forms that are available to artists and artisans. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about the process. Uh, what type of bronze are you using? Are you using the uh, 8535 or using the silicone bronze or we use only silicon bronze. We, we don't want, I, it's, there's several choices involved. One of which is I want to keep as much out of the environment that's, uh, as I possibly can that doesn't really belong there. And anything with lead in it, I generally avoid. So we, we chose right away to stay with just silicon bronze simply because of the cleanliness of that particular alloy. 
We specialize in just, uh, in just silicon bronze, though we do now cast in some precious metals. And we fabricate in virtually all metals. If we need to pour a piece in stainless steel, we'll go through the ceramic shell step stage, and then I will take that out to an acquaintance who has a, a foundry that pours almost nothing but stainless steel for uh, industrial purposes. And he's kind enough to reheat the shells and pour the shell for us. We bring it back here, and of course welding stainless is no more difficult than welding bronze, so then we just go on with the process from there. But it keeps us from having to have a separate furnace and a separate operation to pour uh, high temperature metals like stainless. Uh, and you mentioned that you're using ceramic shell. Are you still using a uh, lost wax as well? Oh yes. Mm -hmm. It's basically a five-step process: from, uh, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive. <laughs> uh, most positives are in clay, though. Uh, people bring in even uh, uh, assembled pieces out of steel. We have pieces in cloth, uh, and right now we were just discussing it earlier. I have a, a large uh, assemblage of pieces that's going to form a fountain that was originally made out of papier mache so we're make, making molds from that. So from that original then we make a rubber mold, from the rubber mold we make a wax copy, from the wax copy we make a ceramic shell mold. The ceramic at that point is still soft and filled with wax so it, the fortuitous experience of melting out the wax also vitrifies the shell. Uh, we're then left with a clean mold that will withstand the temperature and pressures of molten bronze. Uh, bronze melts about 1,880 degrees Fahrenheit, so we heat the bronze and pour it into the, uh, the, the, uh, the shells. They're usually at about 1,400 degrees when we're pouring. So the bronze is poured between 1,900 and 2,000 degrees, depending upon the design, the thickness of the piece, and the uh, complexity of it. And the, uh, the, the ceramic shells being about 1,400 degrees gives us a good flow rate. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, picks up very, uh, it's very high quality, picks up a lot of detail. But so was the solid investment process if properly done. So it's correct. Uh, but this method is, uh, it, it gives us the opportunity to use uh, the fruits of industrial investigations. Uh, as always an, an ongoing process of how to improve the gating process or to improve the, the chemistry involved in the shell. And we, we reap the benefits of industry dabbling in that uh, by drawing upon their expertise and applying it to fine art. We do do chemistry every week doing specific gravity and viscosity of the shell, which is absolutely necessary to, to the structural integrity of it. Very good. We're going to regress a little bit. I want to talk about mold making because I try to teach my students mold making as well. And uh, as we both know, there's so many different types of mold <laughs> materials on the market. and um, in the uh, in your commercial foundry, what do you use and what do you find most successful uh, as far as mold material? It has more to do with the skill of the of the applier than the <laughs> material being used. Uh, the two, the two traditional materials are silicon rubber and polyurethanes. Um, their advantages and disadvantages are both. Um, and thank goodness nobody's still using black tuffy things like that that over a period of ten years turned to some kind of goo in the bottom of a of a mother, which is the part of the mold that holds right. the rubber together. Um, most of the time we're using polyurethanes. Okay. We do use silicon uh, molds, makes, uh, build silicon molds if someone wants to you to make, uh, oh maybe going to cast some in bronze and then maybe do a little bit more in resins and the silicon rubbers, the resins don't stick to them and you don't have to use a parting compound with them so it's uh, a little easier. The silicon rubbers are a little more expensive. They're also, you can't put one down and start it on again tomorrow. Once you start your mold, you've got to complete it okay. uh, as far as the rubber is concerned. And we may be doing 25 molds at a time. You know, we can't afford the largesse of time to sit down and just build a mold all the way through. It's right. working in stages as they go through. So most of the time, probably you're there. A long answer to a simple question, I'm sorry. No, that's fine. That's wonderful. When you're doing your shell process, do you ever use any type of reinforcement? I remember when I we first did the shell process. We started using uh, fiberglasses, lacing in between the layers of the uh, slurry. Uh, do you use anything of that nature? Depends on the piece. Um, that, for instance, we'll use a little zircon sometimes mixed in with the shell uh, in the early stages to give it a little more structural strength. The other thing is that uh, if we're pouring a, a flat panel, a bar relief or an assemblage of, of parts that are essentially flat panels, uh, that we have so much pressure because of the thinness of the wax and the shell being close together and large mm -hmm. surface area that we'll drill some holes through it so that the, the shells bond from one side to the other. 
Uh, other ways of reinforcing that are stainless steel clips that you can make. And again, you're drilling holes and poking stainless steel clips through to do it. Uh, we also reinforce the edges just as you suggested with uh, using a high temperature fiberglass cloth that will bond over the edges, go around the outside, mm -hmm. uh, and then you add shell back to it and it's buried on the inside. Another method, and one we use most often, is by, and it, again with pieces that are essentially flat plate uh, issues, is we'll take gating and build a, a little fence all the way around the piece, which then gives a gap through which the, sh the shell can bond. It also has the additional advantage of like a blind riser. It gives gases a place to go. Mm -hmm. And shell being uh, somewhat uh, porous, that if you can keep enough stack pressure on it, actual gases will escape through the shell as well. So these little narrow fences that we built around allow uh, the stack pressure to force the gases through and serve as blind risers while adding a great deal of structural integrity. Excellent. Uh, from our prior conversation, uh, you say that you pour twice a week and it's usually on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And uh, what are the uh, average, I know every artist makes different sizes of works, uh, can you explain some of the smallest pieces you've done versus some of the largest oh, pieces you've done? I thought about it, I had something to show you, but uh, slowly I will move over this way. Um, this would be typically as small. I can show you one with patina if you prefer. But there's no, this is beautiful. Something. And things even smaller than that. Um, but that's the exception rather than the rule. Most pieces, uh, if we have to look at an average, I suppose, uh, being market driven, uh, the market dictates that bronze sculpture being sold in the gallery needs to be within a certain price range. So you find sculpture that may be a foot high by two feet long, or the reverse, two feet <laughs> high by a foot wide, uh, being about the right same size. Once you get beyond a piece two feet high, then they, they become a little more pricey. And it's, it's an issue, of course, as to quality of artists, the artist's uh, uh, provenance, how well the artist is known, how complicated the piece might be, and the type of patina it takes. Does it take all day to do, a, to do the patina because of the multiplicity of chemicals involved? Mm -hmm. So you can run into a lot of money, uh, which again has to be passed on at every level. And the poor artist trying to make a living out of all of this, uh, so most often ends up with the smallest portion. <laughs> Though we try to help by just operating our foundry on a break-even basis, we just uh, it's it's our retirement project for fun, and uh, as long as we pay our overhead, then we're happy. Uh, can you uh, name some of the more um, notable sculptures that you have cast? I'll just mention a couple because if I start mentioning, I'm going to I'm going to forget somebody, and I don't want to, to annoy anyone with my <laughs> old age and my lack of memory. But the pieces that are most often seen, I suppose, uh, the Michael Jordan figure in front of the United Center in Chicago. Uh, there's a piece that's seen quite often over at Camp, Camp Atterbury in Indiana. Apparently that was one of the primary staging areas during World War I and World War II. So a lot of vets go back and look at it as a large war memorial we did over there. Uh, Cahokia Mounds is a piece that's 12 by 18 feet. It's on the inside of Cahokia Mounds. And I'm told that's seen by hundreds of thousands of people every year. Of course, we just did an 11-foot Lincoln and a 9-foot Douglas for Ottawa, Illinois, and it's, I'm just amazed the number of people who come out of their way to eat uh, lunch in the park and to look at the figures. With this being a Lincoln anniversary year, this is a, it's going to be a lot of that going on. Since this is uh, relatively close to Chicago, we'll talk about the Michael Jordan. How long did it take for that uh, sculpture to be complete? It's very quick. Um, the, the Bulls sort of got the idea they wanted to do this, and once they did, decided they wanted to do it very quickly because Jordan was retiring. Mm -hmm. uh, so everything uh, had to be compressed in terms of time. So we actually uh, did the, did the, the, the the ex well, the execution of the mechanics of building the piece, in other words, making the molds and the castings and welding and all that together, the patina, was done in just, uh, I think, a little over three months, which is awfully fast for a yes. piece that size. Yes. So uh, I'm not sure how long it took the artist to complete the, 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 the original sculpture, but I think it was very quickly as well, something <laughs> about over a three or four month period, because I know they had to have teams of people you know, helping them put clay on just to speed things up right. and, uh, to get going on it. Uh, what was the uh, dimensions of that particular work? And I don't recall. I think it's the piece, it's, I think the overall piece is 16 or 18 feet on the base, mm -hmm. something like that. I think the piece is 12 and a half feet. I think to the top of the basketball. I, I, I'm embarrassed to say I don't recall it. That's okay. Uh, I was out in the foundry at that time when you were working on it and I was amazed at how many times you would have to take and uh, sectionalize uh, each one of the pieces. 
uh, and then weld them together. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you recollect how many times you had to sectionalize the entire sculpture and how many uh, composite pieces were welded together? Uh, you're testing my memory. Yes. <laughs> yes. I, you can estimate. <laughs> as I recall, the Jordan figure had something around 30 pieces involved right. in the whole thing. We like to stay within a size of each component so that a person can easily manipulate it. We found that even though we can do larger sections than that, when it, it makes it more difficult for one person to manipulate, the likelihood for errors to occur increases simply because of the physical exertion involved in it. So it's easy to manipulate a piece. We, we stay within something that is two, foot, two feet square. Uh, that fits easily into the slurry tank for dipping. It fits nicely on the shelves for drying, and it fits easily in the uh, in the kiln for uh, the lost wax process. So that's those dimensions uh, are we we have found produce the best results overall. And when you're constructing the different sections, uh, you're using welding techniques. Can you explain a little bit about what you're using? Mm -hmm. I know uh, in my prior experiences when we use the uh, the gates or the vents, and we would use the in the welding, so we'd match the bronze. Is that still necessary today? Not so much. Uh, the the alloy now that we've uh, silicon bronze is we're able to buy silicon bronze welding rod. That the, we get the assay both on the ingot that we pour, and we get the assay on the welding rod that we buy, and it it's very very close. If we were using alloys other than silicon bronze and by name brand, uh, silicon bronze, Everdure, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, I probably would do more than that. We do keep some of our gates uh, just for that purpose, <laughs> just in case, um, but it's usually more near for, nearly for filling or support. If we want to build an internal structure, for instance, for strength, we'll keep some gating that we can do for lattice work on the interior of the piece. But thank goodness we don't have to do much uh, casting uh, of, um, uh, of gates for welding rod much anymore. Excellent, excellent. Uh, how many people do you have working in your facilities and what type of uh, job descriptions would you give them? Uh, we have ten. The, uh, the, uh, everyone who's come here, uh, we've trained internally. And Very good. Uh, for quite a while we've, we've, uh, we've hired people from all around the country. From some very fine art schools, uh, art majors that have come. But we found that on the long run that the uh, ability to recreate rather than create requires a slightly different mindset than an artist who's desperately trying to be as creative as possible. <laughs> so we found that a person who is more craft and I don't mean to denigrate the craft artists either, because I, that's a fine art as well. It's exactly. Only right. But people involved in the technical side. In other words, I guess it'd be better for us to have an engineer who had some good hand-eye coordination than it would to have an artist uh, who was not as analytical in someone else's with someone else's work. Right. So it's, I'm still being a conductor. And I, in my old music life, and I'm trying to get the violas to balance with the cello, and the French horn to enter on time and on page. <laughs> and it's easier when everyone is a is part of a team in training, okay. rather than the artist who is a conductor in training or a composer in training of uh, an individual. Right. So those people are, have been very difficult to find, as you well might well imagine. Though I'm extraordinarily fortunate in the crew we've got in here right now, I pray for their health every night. <laughs> uh, just wonderful, wonderful people. And uh, you go through the uh, process of wax and then the molds and then uh, you have people who are doing the gating and then the slurry. Is it the same person or do you have different assignments for different people? There's some crossover. Um, everybody here can do more than one thing. One thing is, goodness, it's so boring to just do <laughs> one thing, you know, all day long. So everybody sort of moves around as they as they want. It keeps everyone fresh and good. But in general, uh, we'll have, most people will have two, or at the most three, areas of responsibility that they exercise most often. Excellent. Almost everybody helps in the pool. You know, we just all that's the fun. Well, that's that's part. the fun yeah, part. Yeah, that's always the best part. part. Yeah, yeah it's real wonderful. Guy. Uh, what type of waxes are you using? I was asking uh, one of your uh, colleagues earlier, and she said, "Well, we use you know gating wax and the red wax and mm -hmm. the, the brown stuff." Yeah, uh, they're all microcrystalline waxes. Oh, 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 okay, microcrystalline. All standard right. foundry issue, whether it's for commercial, industrial foundry, or for fine art foundry. 
good. There are other things that can be used, but it's it's best to stay within the industrial um, parameters of normalcy, because then you know exactly what the Rockwell hardness is and the, what the melt temperature is, and as you well know, the pattern needs to melt more slowly than the gating. Right. If the gating gap melts first, then they have a place for the pattern to uh, to escape when right. it's is melting out. Right. If uh, with the converse, it tends to make the shelves blow. <laughs> yes, <laughs> or crack. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> That's not especially the hairline ones when you're pouring are not fun. No. I also saw in the yeah back there that you have uh, in your newer facility has a pit that you bury all your pieces in the sand. Um, how much bronze do you usually melt at one time and how many pieces do you pour uh, per crucible? The, the, the pit is there for safety. Correct. And we bury larger pieces in the pit. I don't know if you noticed, we have also two uh, barrels that are cut in half. And they're also full of sand. And we for the smaller pieces so we can raise the height so it doesn't break our back so much when we're <laughs> bending over to pour them. Uh, we, the, the crucible we use right now is a number, uh, a number 60 crucible, which would, would hold 180 pounds of bronze. We usually pour about 120 pounds per time. It makes it an easy two-man lift. Mm -hmm. um, the, the numbers of pieces or the amount of bronze we'll pour in an, in an average pour day would be around 500 pounds or so. Very good. And uh, how long do the pours last? Do you uh, pour one day all day long or do you break it up and uh, uh, reheat or you have more than one furnace that you utilize? No, we, we go one day until we all collapse from exhaustion <laughs> on the floor. Uh, not really. It's not so bad. Uh, we get you know, everyone gets used to the to the heat, the temperature. And, uh, when you're chasing your pieces, uh, what type of tools are you utilizing to take off the gating? The burr size, which dictates the tool, uh, the burr size goes everything from dental burrs. And I have a, a, several dentist friends who saved me old burrs, and we literally have a, have a whole box full of, of tiny little burrs, dental burrs. Uh, most of the time, the fine chasing takes place, and I'm going from the, the, the wrong end. I'm starting with the That's okay. Stuff, That's all right. <laughs> uh, but in terms of chasing burrs with eighth-inch die grinders, then uh, the more coarse uh, with quarter-inch die grinders, and more coarse yet with angle grinders, uh, but in terms of finishing uh, the piece itself, uh, we use all sorts of abrasives. Uh, there are probably five or six different types, and those go all the way from 40 grit to 320 grit. And sometimes if, we're, if we want to go more, we will actually go to wet, dry, uh, up to 1200 grit, and then even polish. Um, it just depending upon the type of surface and patina that the artist requires. Now that you brought up patina, uh, First time I bet you, uh, you had a torch in your hand and looking at a sulfur, and I come in today and you're doing the torch same thing. Torch in hand, sulfur. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, what type of uh, patinas uh, are most popular, and how many you keep in stock uh, for your clientele? I can do probably 100 to 150 different patinas. The basic patinas are based on browns, reddish browns, greens. Uh, those then can be varied. The patina I was doing today, for instance, uh, was more of a, had more of a pastel nature too, part of it. Uh, and that was done, if we're going with the reddish browns, we might do an underlayment of, of liberal sulfur over that with ferric, ferric nitrate. Uh, in this case, with a mixture of ferric nitrate and uh, added uh, titanium dioxide, bismuth nitrate, uh, little stannic oxide. And we're mixing that together to add to give it more of a creamy texture, uh, and that, that that will serve several different purposes. Because then I can, can with heat control the exact color. The more heat, the more of the russet colors come through. The less heat, the more of the whiter colors. And the the, the relative strength of the of the of the titanium dioxide to the ferric nitrate, the whiter it becomes. So that you can l almost go from a pure white, not quite a pure white, but almost a pure white, almost uh, already a, to almost peach color, mm -hmm. and everything in between. Well, that's excellent. When you're finishing of your bronze wax or bronze pieces, a lot of times I've met artists who uh, apply uh, microcrystalline uh, wax to it. I've met other artists who will use a carnauba wax, and I've met other artists who will even just coat them with shellac. What seems to be the most popular, or does it vary according to where it's going to be placed? It depends upon the patina. Um, I use waxes, as, uh, to me, the wax is part of the patina, because the wax is going to influence the color of the patina. 
that, for instance, if I want more of the substrate or the base colors to come through, say it's a darker liver of sulfur base coat or with something lighter over it, maybe with a cupric nitrate, which it's going to be a green patina. And if I want to stipple that and pick up those blacks coming through the green, then I'll use a high carnauba content wax at a high temperature and will bleed through the, 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 the cupric and pull uh, on, on the, 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 that, that dark color underneath. If I wanted to leave that same patina alone, so that it was exactly as I finished it, I would let the piece completely cool and use a microcrystalline wax. Okay. I can go in between uh, using waxes of different uh, uh, carnauba contents and different temperatures, and then I can control the depth in the layering of the patina. That patina may have five or six layers to it. And if I want to go all the way back down, high carnauba, high heat. If I just want to stay right on the surface, very low heat or no heat, and microcrystalline. I also developed a, a, a whole series of waxes with a chemist in Pennsylvania that were mixing aniline dyes into waxes. And so I've got uh, half a dozen colors or so. Okay, and we can nice. even mix the colors. Oh, very So nice. that we can, uh, can influence that patina with those colored waxes at the same time. Actually, if you want a hint of a color, so if you want just a hint of a misty green to a piece and see a lot of nice, uh, robust yellow bronze coming through, that can be the only patina. Is the carnauba, is the, uh, the aniline dyes will actually oxidize the surface just slightly and the wax okay, then right covers right. and gives a protective coating. But you're asking quite rightly, what about outdoor pieces? Well, all bits right. are off, of course. <laughs> if you do a cupric nitrate piece, a green piece, and put it near the ocean in Florida, and guess what? Day after tomorrow, it'll blush red. Red! <laughs> you know, and everyone is in horror, recoils, you know. That. So to ameliorate those possibilities, most often people are using lacquers. Um, um, but we use an acrylic uh, that is uh, in, for industrial purposes that has been specifically designed for bronze. And if it's applied when the bronze is pretty warm, uh, then as the bronze cools and contracts a little bit, it really makes a good tooth, good bite uh, for the, what's called incrolac. And the incrolac then uh, gets into the patina in the surface and bites rather well. But as all lacquers, if somebody scratches it, now you've opened the surface up and the bronze then can begin to oxidize and you end up with all sorts of problems. So generally over the Incrolac then you play or apply a layer of high carnauba content wax so that the piece is not quite as shiny. And in the, and the, um, in, in poker playing they call it the tell. What gives you the indication of something is not quite right is that when a piece starts getting shiny again then your wax is all worn away so it's time to, to, to reapply that outer protective coat. There's some difficulty involved in that because uh, as we've now gotten into an archival mode, uh, particularly through the Save Outdoor Sculpture program at Smithsonian, is that restoration experts um, really don't want to see lacquer on pieces because it's somewhat difficult to remove without damaging the patina. So they want to see a wax. In fact, the best of all possible waxes would be beeswax, which of course right. doesn't give you much protection. <laughs> so it's uh, we have to think ahead. How do we prepare a piece so that it will be preserved as long as possible, but on the other hand, that uh, sometime in the future the piece is to be restored, how do we make that possible with as little additional work as necessary? Now, I've seen your advertisements uh, in International Sculpture Center and the magazine, and uh, how many times do you get clients from uh, outside the state of Illinois uh, coming in to uh, do casting with you? We have approximately 300 clients around that number at all times, it seems to be. Uh, Probably 40% of them are from the state of Illinois. The rest are outside the state, several out of the country. Cool. So how do you deal with people who are out of the state? Do, do they come and visit you personally, or do they ship the uh, works? And what type of works are they shipping? Are they shipping uh, waxes, or are they shipping uh, plasticine, or are they shipping wood? Uh, uh, what are they shipping yes. you as? <laughs> All the above. All the above. <laughs> That's right. Uh, we have some clients who have, have, in fact, I have two clients who have their own airplane. So they fly into the airport. I go out and pick them up, and we, you know, do have what we do. We have coffee and exchange bronze for uh, for clay or for <laughs> wax or for molds, depending on, on what they want really wish to do. With the really large pieces. Um, we have gone on site many times and made molds wherever it was necessary. That's a relatively expensive way to go about it. It's easier for the artist if they can, can uh, find a, a mold maker, if they're all the way across the country, to do the mold and ship the molds to us. 
Uh, if they do not have uh, someone in mind, we can generally find someone. Uh, it's not always the most cost-effective way to do it. Uh, people who specialize in making molds full-time generally uh, are a little more pricey than, than foundries who are mixing the costs in with all the other steps. So it's, um, it, it's all of the above. Uh, and now we've added uh, laser scanning to our process so that, for instance, people who want to work in mar maquette size then can ship the maquette. People who wish to work in full scale, we can uh, take the laser scanner to them uh, okay. uh, laser scan and work from that, or we can go the, to take the laser scanner to them and scan the maquette and enlarge it. Or we can make the molds on site, all sorts of ways. Uh, what do you see in the future for sculpture utilizing uh, high-tech equipment? This is a problematic area because uh, I've been researching this area rather strongly for over four years. Uh, I res have resisted for a, for a good while because of the tactile nature. Uh, in other words, I would much prefer a pipe organ to an electronic organ. I, I, I think there's something in the art world that requires the humanity, the interaction of humanity with a medium. And once you place an interface, an arbitrary barrier somewhere in there, that some of that connection is lost. On the other hand, there is not a student that graduates from any art school today who's not been playing video games since they were 12 that is not fully conversant with manipulating programs in the computer and find that they maybe have had a computer graphics course in college in addition to their medium, or it may be their medium itself. So it, it's, uh, we have to play, we have to be part of it, otherwise we're going to miss the opportunity to have those relationships with artists who find the digital medium the most natural thing in the world. Right. You know, it's just the old fogies like me who still <laughs> remember carving by hand, you know, that, uh, that actually that, uh, find that a bit of, a, of an aesthetic uh, issue, uh, a philosophical issue as well. Well, I know that anytime you have a monumental competition, uh, uh, the people who jury those, all they look at is my cats. They don't look at truck size. So I think this would lend to the uh, construction of a large piece from a mock It does. And um, beyond that, uh, we've just added a new program using a haptic technology. It's the same thing that surgeons use now in, uh, in med school to be trained to do surgery when there are not enough cadavers to go around. They actually can feel the scalpel cut the flesh and can tell the difference between soft tissue and muscle, for instance. This also works for sculptors. So we've just bought this technology, so a sculptor works with a sculpting tool in their hand and in a, a digital area defined, we create a piece of clay, and the clay is in the computer. We look in the monitor, and you can be additive or reductive sculptor. So if you are a stone carver and are used to car <laughs> taking away or, or a wood carver, then you uh, literally a keystroke and enter, and you carve that clay. And the advantage is that when you're carving clay normally, you make little nubs and things that you have to clean off long this program removes those as you go, so you get very clean cuts and everything. If you are an additive sculptor uh, and you're, you're taking clay in your hands and adding and pinching and feeling and rubbing and making it all go with your hands, it does, it, does that also. A single keystroke and it changes to an additive process. If, for instance, you find yourself wanting to change the volume of a piece, oh, that would add a lot, no, no. Now, one keystroke and enter and you can reach your tool inside this block and actually push out. Excellent. So you can sculpt entirely in the computer. Uh, the classically trained sculptor, it, that's anathema. <laughs> uh, to, the, uh, to the young person just coming out of art school, it's, it's why haven't they been doing this before? <laughs> now, the great advantage is, well, I maybe should start with the disadvantage. Of laser scanning, this is all this rapid prototyping, is really reverse engineering. So as you go through each layer, you lose quality. Okay. So you get a, a, a maquette, and it's very finely crafted, a uh, lot of technique and detail in it. You laser scan, and you lose some of that because of the density of pixels and because of light refraction, picking up some stray pixels. So heretofore, you import that into your computer, into a program, and you sit there with a CAD program and a mouse, and you're clicking away pixels you don't want. 
Turns out that this new Heptic software, this freeform modeling system I just described, can be used to clean up the laser scan point cloud. Oh, okay. So now you create this wonderful point cloud and can go in and put every bit of the detail. Cloud. So it has a filter in there so you can take care of all the... Literally do it with your tool. Oh, very nice. By hand. Very nice. So and is it, is it right on the screen? Is right on the screen. And for instance, if you had, if you were working in a mock cap, let's be ridiculous. Okay. You were working in a mock cap this size. How much detail could you get on an eye? <laughs> you know, if you were doing a portrait. <laughs> yeah, you know, not much, <laughs> just a little dab. All right, now if we have long that up to 12 feet high, now you need an eye that's like this. Well, maybe like that. Correct. Well, if you've got a large monitor, we can blow the whole eye up the size of the monitor, and you can put every little bit of detail. In fact, we could even take the corner of the eye and put it in there. So all of that fine detail can go back in, and then we can use the marvelous technology of 5-axis CNC nails and stereolithography. That's the quality of the, of the reverse engineering uh, uh, machinery is better than the digitizing side. Now we've got a chance to fix it. So this is a very exciting time. Yes, yes. I was also noticing that you have this base that you could put your maquette on and it rotates at 360. Is this work in sync with your scanner or your uh, monitor that uh, it goes at a certain speed so it can pick up all the different detail? and Continuous then... scan, so you're not piecing together segments. I'm more and more getting, going, going to get involved in the uh, interface of technology and art. Um, one, it's just interesting to sort of move in different directions from time to time. And I think also, whether I like the idea or not, it, it is going to be a, a meaningful part of the future. So, uh, it's, if you want to play, <laughs> ante up. <laughs> right. So we've got to do it. And I'm, I'm also very, very interested in what can be done with technology and uh, it, can we use it in a different way. For instance, uh, there's an artist in, in Chicago who's an astrophysicist. A uh, young man is one of the most brilliant people I've ever met. You know, we can talk about string theory for a few minutes, and then the very next leap in mathematics is something I have no clue of where he's going. Uh, just really a remarkable person. He cannot wait to get his hands on this. He wants to see, as a sculptor, what he can do. Oh, very good. Manipulating this, this technology. You know, I'm very, very excited to see someone who is both scientist and artist and sculptor um, get involved in this and see other, something other than rubber ducks and things, which is, frankly, the, this combination of software and hardware that, that you see here today, there's only one other combination like that in the United States, and it's owned by a shoe factory. Part of my uh, program is trying to educate uh, not only the community, but also other artists and artisans. Um, part of the problems that I think most artists face is resources, and that means as far as educational resources, where to buy product. Uh, can you give uh, some of the people information on where they could research sculptural materials and uh, information on techniques? Because uh, otherwise, phone calls come all the time and, and you're serving mm -hmm. as a consultant. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very important for people to understand that research in a particular field is equally as important and it will also uh, cuts down on uh, their economy of time. Well, as an academic, that's how my wife and I learned to do this whole process. Uh, we were researching it a bit, trying to you know, help sell this foundry for the, the family of the original owner. Uh, you just go to the library and start checking out books. Uh, and you read all about gating, and you know, it's basically some fluid dynamics. You know, so if you had a little fluid dynamics in college, you would understand uh, full well how it works, or go to the engineering school and ask them to explain it to you. Uh, and pretty quickly, you find out how uh, the the, um, the the process of gating works. How it, it's in theory what's behind it. And what, like everything in higher education, again, I'm preaching to the choir. Everything in higher education uh, is about learning. The, the, the concept of the thing. Uh, once you learn how something actually works, then a reasonably inventive person ought to be able to finish the job, depending upon uh, what materials and technique is required. I mean, if everyone went to engineering school today and learned the current engineering standards, uh, tests, uh, uh, techniques, machines, everything involved in it, by the time they got out, it all would have changed. 
so it's how the process works. So you can go to the library and start digging into all of these things. There are many, many books out on most all subjects, uh, at least half a dozen patina books. Not so many books out for the art foundry person. But then again, that's not where the cutting edge is anyway. Uh, go to the American Foundryman Society and dig through some monographs there. That, if you want to know what's really going on, uh, subscribe to the issues. Now, most of that's going to be technical jargon for manufacturing purposes. But every now and then, you have to dig and find the little diamonds that exist in the pile of, of carbon. So it's all it's all in there. The best thing in the world to do, just my own personal advice, is make friends with somebody who knows how to do this. Is go and, and ask. And most people are most willing to share what they know. Uh, you're quite right. I answer the phone probably 30 times a day for somebody who's got a patina problem across the country or a mold making question or something. And I'm delighted to do that. Uh, that's the old educator in me. I'm <laughs> happy to pass along what I've learned. I mean, that's my mission in life. So, you know, if you've got a foundry nearby of, 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 um, that does good work, uh, never hesitate to, uh, for any art major, I would think, you know, uh, after they get out of school, what do they do when they don't have access to you? Right. You know, they're across the country. Uh, then go find somebody, a uh, foundry there, and find out what techniques they're using. And you'll find every foundry you go in is like different techniques. Right. So, steal well, I, I still get my students calling me from Florida <laughs> and Texas and uh, asking me to solve their problems over the phone. Mm -hmm. And it, it, at times you're able to do some of it. And they remember you at Christmas, right? Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you have a website that people could uh, view the uh, foundry and also the gallery? Yes. It's an amateurish one that I did myself. That's all right. Why don't you tell everybody what it is? Oh, it's Harry at harryspell.com. <laughs> Excellent. And then we will be able to have like a, a small tour of the gallery. Yeah. Excellent. So for anybody who wants to go, say it again. Harry at harryspell.com. Excellent. <laughs> All right, Harry, I think I'm run out of questions and you've been very gracious for us to be here today. Uh, and it's been wonderful visiting again. <laughs> and uh, we're going to go see your gallery. Absolutely. All right. Thanks, Thanks you, sir. sir.